This video was produced for the Leonor Annenberg Institute for Civics of the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania. When the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution that would guide America's new government, they gave Congress the power to enact laws. Congress is made up of the House of Representatives and the Senate. While only members of Congress can write the bills, anyone can have an idea for a bill, because ideas are where bills begin. It is a long process, but very rarely do, is the way you write it, is that exactly the way it ends up, because we are an ideas body and we like to make an idea better. Republican Congressman Pete Sessions is visiting Nimitz High School in Irving, Texas, to talk with students from teacher Helen Bradley's class about how a bill becomes a federal law. The process begins when someone has an idea to fix a problem or address a need. Let's say it's a dilapidated bridge on a federal highway that runs through the community. For the idea to become a bill, it needs to be shared with a member of Congress who agrees there's a problem and is willing to support legislation to fix it. A person would write a bill, meaning a member of Congress would write a bill. That bill would then be what we call dropped in the hopper, which means there's a little box in, down on the floor of the House of Representatives where when you have your bill done, you put your name on it. That would then be referred by the parliamentarian of the House of Representatives to a committee. Just as soon as you have an idea about a bill, doesn't mean I've got the best idea. It means I've got an idea that I'm trying to push. And as soon as that bill is referred to a committee, there are a lot of people who are looking at all those bills. And just as soon as you drop a bill, there can be people who are opposed to what you do. Could you explain what happens in the committee process? Oh, good question. There are 19 standing committees in the House of Representatives, such as Armed Services, Education and Labor, Judiciary, Natural Resources, Science and Technology. The bill is referred to a committee that has jurisdiction over that issue. In our example, the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee would handle the bill to fix the dilapidated bridge. Now, at the time that happens, it's then up to a member of Congress to say, I think I'd like to get other people who would want to be on my bill, which would be an indication to the committee that there is widespread or wider spread uh, number of people who were interested in this bill becoming law. In other words, that they agreed with that. That is the point at which you go out and you begin selling your bill. And that has a lot to do with how a member of Congress either has friends or organizations that will help that member go and sell the idea that they're trying to sell. There are two kinds of bills, appropriation and authorization. Authorization bills are those bills that come from committees, for instance, like the Judiciary Committee, and they're concerned with the policy of the laws the policy that would be embedded for the judiciary, that is the Department of Justice, and that is the judiciary and laws of our country. And they would bring forward, law, uh, forward bills that would be about policy. And appropriations bills are spending bills. And spending bills, as you will note in your Constitution, must originate in the House of Representatives. That's an important point. In most cases, a bill can begin the legislative process in either the House or in the Senate. Committee members review information they have been given about the issue, and they may hear testimony from expert witnesses. How much do lawmakers have to ne negotiate and compromise to pass a bill? It is a difficult, long, arduous process, but one which I think makes a bill better gains a consensus of people who sees the importance of it, and then hopefully will become law in a way that would be responsible and public policy that would be good for people. The next step is for committee members to vote on the bill. If the bill does not get enough votes, it dies in committee. 
If the bill passes, it will be sent to the full House of Representatives for consideration. But before the bill actually gets to the full House, it will likely be sent to the Rules Committee, which reviews all major pieces of legislation. And so it is my hope that you would balance the bill out. Thirteen representatives sit on the House Rules Committee, nine are from the majority party, and four, including Representative Sessions, are from the Republican minority. The Rules Committee is responsible for taking legislation that would come to the House floor and we make a decision on it in terms of when it will come to the floor, what time it will be debated, what will be made in order, meaning an amendment that would be made in order, and then the time frames and then any points of order that could be made against those bills. What are the responsibilities of the leaders of the House? More specifically, what power does the Speaker exert over legislation? And what is the role of the party whip? First, who are these people? The Speaker and the party whip? Well, a new Congress convenes every two years following the November elections. In the 2006 elections, Democrats won a majority of the 435 seats in the House of Representatives. The 110th Congress was sworn in the following January. Representative Nancy Pelosi of California was elected Speaker of the House by her fellow Democrats. If you are the Speaker of the House of Representatives, you get to choose what legislation comes to the floor of the House of Representatives. No one else decides that, just the Speaker. In 2007, the House Democratic leadership of the 110th Congress includes a majority leader, Representative Steny Hoyer, and a majority whip, Representative John Lewis. It is then up to the whip to get the votes that is necessary to pass that. Leading the minority is Republican House Leader Representative John Boehner and the Republican Whip, Representative Roy Blunt. On the Republican side, there is a whip also, and their job is to go and get the votes to defeat it. The full House follows the same general process as in committee. Those supporting the bill will try to pass it. Those not in favor of the bill rally for the votes to defeat it. You will see the lead Democratic member and then the lead Republican member who will be debating the bill and then their members that are on the committee debating those bills. What is this debate about? This debate is all about trying to give information to people for persuasion of letting them know what's the context of the bill, what is in the bill, and then try and try and sway people to get them to vote for your side. And then the House votes. If there are enough votes to pass the bill, it goes to the other chamber in Congress, the Senate. If not enough members of the House support it, the bill dies. When a bill is voted down by a committee, what happens to it? Can it be brought back up again? And when a bill is voted down by the full House of Representatives, what happens to it and can it be brought back up again? Good questions. You know, you've got all these great ideas you follow the process, and then somebody doesn't agree with you. What do you do if you have this bill that you really want to pass, but you learn something along the way? Maybe your committee chairman didn't like it. Maybe your team didn't show up that day. Maybe it failed in subcommittee. There are other ways to have your bill become law. Generally speaking, either you can wait until the next year or you can try and get your bill tacked on or added as an amendment to something else that is germane. Where we can say, that had something to do with this bill. So the bill has made it through the House. On the Senate side, it is assigned to one of 16 standing committees, such as Agriculture, Nutrition and Forestry, Environment and Public Works, Small Business, Again, where the bill goes depends on which committee has jurisdiction over that particular issue. At Shore High School in Montebello, California, Stephen Anderson is leading his students in a discussion about issues. In a way, it's, it's good for all of us. Yeah. I mean, do you guys think there will ever be free health care in the United States? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Part of this lesson is having students work in small groups to reach a consensus on what they think are the most important issues, the way members of Congress must reach a consensus to pass legislation. You're going to go through all of the issues and you're going to figure out in a group, in consensus, consensus is difficult. What does consensus mean? Sir. Exactly, all together, you're going to make an agreement. Students saw just how difficult it can be to reach a consensus, and they wanted to ask California Senator Dianne Feinstein how she handles important issues with other members of Congress. The key, I've always said, is knowing when to go to the wall and when to make the compromise. You can't go to the wall all the time. We taped some of the students' questions and asked Senator Feinstein to respond. Hello, Senator. My name is Zeth Luhan. And I was wondering, have you ever had any personal conflicts while you're passing a law? That's a very good question. And in this respect, I think I am a little bit independent. If I don't believe something is right, I'm not going to vote for it just because my party says to. And I made up my mind to that a long time ago. Senator Feinstein is chairman of the Senate Rules and Administration Committee. She also sits on the Judiciary, Appropriations, and Intelligence Committees. Committees are where much of the legislative work gets done. Hi, my name is Luis Casillas. I have a question for you, Senator. What is the impact of lobbyists having deciding controversial issues such as gun control? Aha. Lobbyists can be very productive or they can be very destructive. And you mentioned gun control. Um, when I came to the Senate, everybody said big oil was the biggest lobby. And then I did, in 1993, the assault weapons legislation. And I learned a little bit about big guns in this country and the National Rifle Association and other associations. And I came to the conclusion that big guns is the toughest and in a great, to a great extent, the most effective. Okay, back to Congress. We left our bill in a Senate committee where just like in the House, it is discussed and debated, revised and amended, and then put to a vote. If the bill does not receive enough votes, it dies in committee. If the bill is approved by committee, it may head to the full Senate for consideration or it may not. You see, the rules in the Senate are different. There are 100 members of the Senate, two from each state. In 2007, the Senate leadership consists of Majority Leader Senator Harry Reid and Assistant Majority Leader, or Democratic Whip, Senator Richard Durbin. The Senate Republicans are led by Minority Leader Senator Mitch McConnell and Assistant Minority Leader, or Republican Whip, Senator Trent Lott. How does the Senate's dealing with legislation contrast with that of the House? In the House of Representatives, it is majority rule, majority vote. So things would come through, we would put them on the floor, and we would find out whether it was going to win or whether it was going to fail. This majority rule way of operating in the House is called regular order. The Senate operates under unanimous consent. The Senate has very strong minority rights particularly the filibuster, which can be carried out by one individual if there isn't a unanimous consent agreement, an individual that once they have the microphone, it can't be taken away from them. So they can just proceed to talk. A filibuster is a delaying tactic. Another action called cloture can end debate. Cloture can be used when the majority leader puts a bill on the floor and a senator objects to the bill. If I am listening or my staff is listening and they see the majority leader at the end of a Senate session say, I am calling up item number one, two, three, four, five, which is X, Y, and Z, and I say to my staff, put a hold on it, and they call down and they say, Senator Feinstein puts a hold on it, that begins a cloture process. That means I don't really don't like the bill, I'm going to do everything I can to keep it from coming to a vote. When a bill does come to a vote by the full Senate and there aren't enough votes to pass it, you guessed it, it dies. But when the Senate approves a bill, it goes to the president for his signature. It is ready to become a law, unless the president objects to the bill. 
If the president vetoes legislation that was initiated by the House, what are the steps a bill would be put through if the House wanted to try to override the vote veto? The House of Representatives just a few weeks ago passed what was called an S-CHIP bill, State Children's Insurance Program, and that is the federal government's opportunity to work and partner with states for insurance for children who parents are above the poverty level but still what we call the working poor. And so the president had said, I am not in favor of that piece of legislation. Didn't bother the House. The House passed their bill. The Senate passed their bill. Went to the president. What did the president say? I told you I would not sign this. In fact, the president vetoed the bill. It came back and then it came to the House of Representatives first and we had a veto override that did not override the president. Hello, Senator. My name is Alexander Wu. And I just want to know, if the president was part of a different party, is it harder to pass laws? Good question, and the answer is yes, Alexander. It's very difficult. It's much easier when you have a president of your party and when that party has a majority in the House and the Senate. In this case, both the House and the Senate majority is controlled by Democrats, and the presidency is controlled by a Republican. Therefore, you have to get a presidential signature on a bill. And if he doesn't sign it, but instead vetoes it, you've got to have 67 votes in the Senate to override the veto. When the president vetoes a bill, Congress can let the bill die, revise the bill and try again, or vote to override the president's veto. Two-thirds of the members of both houses must agree to override the veto. That's 290 votes in the House and 67 votes in the Senate. But if the president agrees with the bill that has been passed by the House and the Senate, he signs it, and the bill becomes a law. Congress has been criticized for moving slowly in developing legislation. Do you think the process needs to be sped up? Congressman Sessions acknowledged that Congress has been criticized for moving too slowly on some uh, issues like immigration. One proposal would have given immediate citizenship to immigrants in the United States. There are times when we say, boy, I wish the House or the Senate or Congress had passed that legislation and yet not every piece of legislation, even though we want to handle the issue, once the answer became known, the American people said, I want you to handle the issue, but not the way you are. And so it died in the Senate. The process of an idea becoming a bill, becoming a law, is not very glamorous. And it can be pretty dull sometimes, as members of Congress wrangle over complicated language. It's called a deliberative body. In a sense, that means a slow-moving body. It's based, I believe, on the fact that no legislation is better than bad legislation. This process is important to each and every one of us. It is the process that determines the policies that govern our lives, where government spends our money, how government meets our needs. The American dream will be alive and well as long as you continue to not only understand what we stand for, but how to make these ideas become present in our lives to make our country better. This video was produced for the Leonore Annenberg Institute for Civics of the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania.